Hello everyone and welcome to the TVC podcast with me, Tony Lowe. Today I wanted to talk about this idea of politics as, as a bit of a modern myth. And I had to think carefully about what exactly I mean by that. And I want to make a distinction straight away, really. I don't mean that all politics is a myth. I don't mean that there is no such thing as politics or never has been. It's not quite what I'm saying. But what I really do mean is that this modern idea of of politics is something worth, frankly, even worth discussing or thinking that we get involved in or have any say or sway over, is a myth. It's uh, it's a fantasy that's uh, only becoming more of a fantasy over time, I think. I want to roll this back a little bit. I, uh, I studied politics, well, mostly I, when I say study politics, I study political theory at university. And over the course of that, it became pretty clear to me that all of the political systems we have not only don't work, but I don't think they can work either. And in particular, I'm thinking of the main political systems that we've got. Broadly speaking, you'd say that they are... Um, Socialism, for sure. A uh, cap- capitalistic systems, obviously, that we live in as well. And we live some, with some Frankenstein blending of the two at the moment. But then also this underlying current of liberalism, especially Western liberalism. And it became quite clear that all of these are just frank dead ends. Um, the idea of communism being a dead end should go without saying. Actually, what, what do I mean? What do I mean by them being dead ends? Well, I mean that they don't produce societies that you would actually want to live in or can be sustainable for uh, long periods of time. And even if they can be sustained, again, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to live in them. Right. Um, If the Soviet Union could last for 500 years instead of less than 100, it wouldn't make it any more appealing, frankly. Um, But we have a a slightly worse situation now. Even if you take our political ideals just as ideals, then it's going to be a dead end. You know, just take liberalism, for example. Liberalism is a crazy, crazy um, example of that because by its own logic, liberalism must collapse under its own weight. L- liberalism is the political equivalent of relativism, where you basically say all forms of living and all forms of uh, approaches to life and all cultures are really equal. And the only thing we need to do is, the only law that we live by is that all of them should be compatible at the same time. We find like a common strand of culture which allows all cultures to exist together. Absolutely insane because the cultures across the world fundamentally are incompatible. Fundamentally. So when, sure, if you have a street and on one side of it there's uh, the Hindus and on the other side there are the Muslims and theoretically speaking, if their lives never encounter each other in any intimate way, then those two people can coexist. But that's not what happens, is it? Because the Muslims and the Hindus have to go to the same school. They want their kids to be taught the same things. They have different opinions about what kind of structures and um, culture they should have around them and what things they should be exposed to, what things they find permissible. And so indeed, when Muslims and Hindus are trying to shape the same society to, to resemble something they want, then damn, you're going to reach a conflict pretty pretty quickly, right? And that's why liberalism doesn't work, because you're trying to square the circle. You're trying to make all of these contradictory cultures be consistent with each other, and it just can't happen. So uh, communism doesn't work because you have like the pricing problem, and f- frankly, the econ- economics just falls apart. The other reason why it doesn't work, and I think this is a bit more practical, is, uh, you know, I used to my university was heavily, heavily Marxist. So we used to discuss this with people quite a lot. They'd say, well, you know, real communism hasn't been tried and all that kind of stuff. And they would also say like, uh, well, all we need to really do is, is make sure the revolution happens and then we can overturn the capitalistic overlords and now have a fair and democratic society. And you think, what? Fair and democratic? 
Because what they don't think through is the fact that to have that glorious revolution, a bunch of people will have to have a bunch of guns. And it's not like every person is going to have the same caliber gun or the same willingness to use them. So really what you have is you have this group of people with the guns and the power who point them at the other people who have guns and power. And then after that, they they take the throne, right? Then you've got to ask, how does your wonderful utopian communist system ensure that the people with the guns put them down, bring in the glorious democracy, and everyone now lives free and happily? What makes them do that and stops them from just taking the guns that they've got, turning around, pointing them, at, pointing them at the people and saying, now you can just give us your money instead, right? Realpolitik. And that is how it did work. That is how it will work in the future. And that is another reason why this whole idea of a communistic revolution transition into a utopia is just insane. However, I do give the Marxists credit for one thing. They're right when they say that capitalism, well, I frankly think it's evil. And you might say, well, that doesn't make me a commie. No, because that's just stupid binary thinking. It's not like they're the only two possible approaches to politics. That's just the two ends of the spectrum that we've been given for the last hundred, couple of hundred years, really. Capitalism is also evil because what's capitalism all about? Well, it's about profit for the sake of profit. And by definition, a, a world which has finite resources cannot make an infinite and growing profit. And then the other thing, even aside from that, even if you say there are ways that it can be done, if we keep reimagining the, the, the idea of value or whatever, it doesn't matter because still what it does is it places the priority on greed, basically. You know, Milton Friedman, the uh, great capitalist eco economist, said that. He said, well, what communism, what um, capitalism does is it shows that greed is good because you're, you're using everyone's selfish interest to gain profit and material wealth, basically, to keep pushing society forward. Uh, no, that's corrupt. It, not only does it warp people's values, but as we see, it also is corrupting society as well. It's making it not only superficial, but that is another thing which is creating this liberal madness of culture blending. Because the, now the common thing that every culture has in common is now their desire for greed and, and wealth. Which means that you're bringing all of these different cultures together just so they can make money with each other while still not solving the underlying problem that these cultures cannot live together because they're not compatible with each other. So it's, uh, it's blending nations, it's, it's, uh, it's pushing globalism, and it's frankly diluting the value of morality in society. So yes, communism is evil. Damn, capitalism is evil as well. So if you like, I think that's a fair sweep at the three main parts of modern society, right? We have liberalism, capitalism, communism, you might say they're, they're economic systems, but really they're the backdrop for the apparent political system that we've got, that we've told we have in the Western world, which is democracy, or at best a republic. They don't exist. And this is what I really wanted to move into with this idea that politics is a modern myth. You see your people arguing about all different aspects of politics in the street, right? Um, or even on news channels. What are we going to do about our democracy? Uh, how do we as uh, sensible citizens guide and manage our democracy in order to make the world a better place? Uh, how do we as citizens get involved with politics in order to improve it? It's all a complete farce. Let me just explain one thing to you. I live in the UK, for example, and people might say, well, therefore I'm a democratic citizen. Well, what is democracy to me as a citizen? I, I get involved in democracy for one and exactly one day every four years. Election year, right? Election year comes round and on one day I get to walk into a booth and I get to put an X in a box to say who I want to vote for. And then by the time I leave that booth, I will not directly get involved in politics apparently again for another four years now we could say that, that actually has some value if it really had any real significance but then i consider a bunch of other things as well i put that x on that box that box then um, gets put together with a load of other boxes and they decide the local mp for that area for the given party right so for us it's usually labor or conservative 
the Americans, for example, it would be Democrat or Republicans. I, the systems are obviously slightly different, but the main overall idea is always the same. And then that person then gets elected, right? My local MP gets, gets elected and maybe they all sit in parliament. And parliament is where all the democracy apparently happens. Now, what does actually happen, right? So the MPs all come together. People, by the way, who none of us, most of us have never actually met. Um, the people, the person who I put that little tick in the box for, I've never met face to face. I don't even know what they look like. Um, and that is, the, that is the case for the majority of the votes that we cast. So these faceless representatives, as they're called, sit in the House of Parliament. And then they come together to discuss how the country should be run. Assuming in the first place that they even represent your values, right? Because I might be choosing Labour or Conservative, but I might hate both at a fundamental level. I might think both are evil, but I'm just choosing the lesser of the lesser demon, basically. So these uh, people come together and they start discussing how the country should be run. And then they draft together, they draft uh, what laws should be put in place. Now, here's the thing. In, uh, in Britain, we actually have two um, halves to our parliament. We have the House of Commons, which is what we're speaking about now, where all of these MPs come together and they, uh, they rabble about what laws we should have and what policies they should pass. But then they pass those policies to the second half of parliament, which is the House of Lords. The House of Lords. And the funny thing about the House of Lords is that it's full of people who were never democratically voted for in the first place, right? There isn't a single lord who was chosen by the public. They all get there either by being elected by other lords, but, or I think there's a hereditary aspect to it as well. It's basically our aristocracy uh, keeping the reins of power in that part of parliament. So think about that. This democratic society of ours, we get involved in it once a year, and then we send these people to the House of Commons and then those people draft laws and policies. And then here's what happens. They then send those policies to the House of Lords and then the House of Lords can go, oh, we don't like this one. Oh, we don't like what you peasants have said about these, uh, these tax reforms. No, send it back. Send it back. Try again. They have veto power over the laws that we have. And so if they send it back, the Commons have to go, oh no, what are we going to do now? We have to redraft it so the Lords will like it. We send it back to the Lords and the Lords go, okay, you peasants can have this one. We'll pass it through. Keeping in mind, by the way, that at any time, I think, the uh, Queen technically has veto power on this stuff as well, technically speaking. Democratic country, apparently, right? We the people run it. No, we don't. Never did. Um... The political class runs the country at best, and the lords also run it. We, our democratic involvement is at best a sliver of that that happens once every four years. It's not a democracy. The people don't decide what happens. Now, that's just looking at the surface picture of what goes on in the UK. But if you zoom out a bit, or in some cases, even if you zoom in, you see that the thing is way more uh, farcical than that. Because think, for example, about these great global institutions which are all basically playing the same game, right? We already get the impression, for example, that although they seem to argue and wrestle with each other, uh, there's a lot of things that Labour and the Conservatives really have in common. Are they really that different from each other, fundamentally? Are they all not pushing society ultimately in the same direction? Do we not see the same thing with the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States? I think so. Um, is it possibly the case that these parties are funded by the same institutions? That they're supported or swear allegiance to the same institutions? Um, for example, isn't it interesting that the UK... Well, not the UK government anymore because of Brexit, but... The Italian government, for example, no matter what party gets into power, will still have the answer in some way to the, uh, the EU. The American government, whether it's Republicans or Democrats on the seat, will still have to, ask to answer in some way to the UN. 
don't these institutions also have a lot of overlap within them between different people who are being funded? Maybe they've got the same bankers who are playing both sides of the coin. Um, and as you can see, if you zoom out, society is still pushing in that one overall liberal direction. It's still holding to that ideal, even if it's just playing out. I mean, all it really comes down to is that, uh, liberalism and globalism either comes in slowly with the conservatives or quickly with the liberals. And that's really the main difference as far as I can see. And then you have, uh, as we've always already kind of mentioned, these multinational institutions, right? Like the UN, the EU, the World Economic Forum. They're another interesting player, right? You find that many of these world leaders that we currently have uh, were created by the World Economic Forum. They were all members of it at some point. You know, Boris Johnson, if I remember correctly, was in fact a member of the world, or is in fact a member of the World Economic Forum. Um, actually, let me just have a look. Yeah, so it turns out there's a few of them in there. As I said, we have old uh, old Bozza, who's a member of the World Economic Forum. Old uh, Trudeau is also a member. Quite a lot said about him on there. Joe Biden, obviously, is listed as a, uh, a main contributor to the World Economic Forum agenda. And you've even got people like Will I Am. A famous artist as someone who's contributing to the World Economic Forum. And an institution like that is interesting because they come right out and say it, right? They come right out and say that they are trying to manage the global economy. And, and that means they want to manage the way people across the world live their lives. If you go and read their um, the book they brought out on the heels of COVID-19, they talk quite directly about how society in their next great industrial revolution needs to be changed right down from the macro societal level, right down to the level of the individual and how they know the best way to do that. Did you ever vote for any of these people? Now, putting the politicians aside, did you, for example, vote for Klaus Schwab, who's the main chairman of the World Economic Forum? Of course not. In fact, the other thing you've got to consider is all of these policies that they say are going to be brought in, that they announce openly that are going to be brought in, none of those are voted for. What say do you have in that? In fact, there isn't a single suggestion in any of their writing about their great transformations, about uh, basically making the whole world into a kind of, uh, what would you even call it? A chimera of capitalist, socialistic uh, oligarchy, I suppose. Great, enormous techno banker autocracy. They don't talk about how, they never give the single impression that any of this will be a matter of uh, be put down to a vote or that it will bend to the will and wants of the people. Now, they say they're obviously doing all of this for the greater good of the people across the world but they never give any impression that we'll have a say in the matter and they're right we won't have a say in the matter not not through the political means that we have available um none of us have a direct say on whether really on whether we're going to have the bins taken out twice a week or once a week i think we're going to have a say on whether how our entire global economy is going to be managed democratically sure if you become the owner of a bank one of the largest banks in the world, you might have some kind of say. You become the owner of a great multi-billion dollar tech company, you might have some say. Probably not even that much, to be quite frank. Because even these people we're speaking about, like the crazy Joe, the Trudeaus, the, the Johnsons, Will I Am, they're all still beholden to people above them. And it's not like these things all work as a great democracy either. I don't think the World Economic Forum is a democracy even for its members. So what's this whole talk of politics then? What's this whole idea of us getting involved in politics and changing the world? I think at most our involvement in politics is politicians don't want to annoy us or agitate us so much that we all go completely insane and kill all of them in a single day. 
So if society seems like they're extremely unhappy with something, they won't read our opinions, they'll read our mood. I think that's what they track. I think they try and gauge, okay, enough people are unhappy about this, so maybe we should change something to appease the appease that fact. Meanwhile, we become um, satiated with that change for a little while while they can move all of their machinations in the background. Get out of the false binaries, people. They don't exist. Uh, stop arguing with people about whether they should be liberal or conservative. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I am certainly more of an advocate of the right wing of the political spectrum in terms of ideals and morals, usually. Um, but I wouldn't pretend for a second that I am, you know, pro-conservative. I'm not. I, th I think they're just as bad and corrupt as the liberals are in many ways. Um, so if we keep scrapping with each other at that level, I think we're just... But we're either missing the picture, we're playing the same game that they are. In many ways, I think the solution is to forget about politics. Because again, you're just playing a false game to begin with. Uh, try and live your own life. Maybe find some land somewhere and build your own home. Form your own local community. And treat politics as a kind of weather pattern that indeed is probably getting worse. But that ultimately is out of your hands. The only thing that you can really do is weather the storm. For example, if the whole global economy decides that fuel is now going to cost, well, what is it now, like four and a half dollars a gallon in America, so it's almost two pounds here in the UK, easily the most expensive it's ever been by a country mile. You find out tomorrow that it's maybe five pounds or 10 pounds or 20 dollars. Well, maybe it helps if you live in such a way that doesn't require you to use fuel. Understand the whole thing is a rigged game and it's probably working against your favour, but act accordingly. But stop being distracted by the question of politics. I'd even say go as far as to stop arguing about it. The only reason we should argue about politics is to prove that politics is a complete waste of time, as far as I'm concerned. And all of this scrapping in the middle. Oh, can you believe what that politician said the other week? Oh, can't you believe that new scandal coming out of Downing Street? Oh, can you believe this new tax reform that they brought in through Parliament? Yeah, I can believe all of it. And it's all basically a waste of time. So that's why I think politics is a modern myth. Now again, I don't therefore think that all questions of social arrangement or power are therefore a complete waste of time. There were, and perhaps there will be in the future important uh, conversations to have about power structures and how we decide to be governed and help govern each other, right? So if, for example, you do ever get the chance to form your own little local community, yeah, probably you'll still be tangled in to the system in some way. You'll still have to pay your taxes, you know, render unto Caesar and all that kind of stuff. But let's say you form a little community of, a little rural community of, of people around you and you decide we're going to try and govern our lives in our own way as much as we can. Well, you still have to decide there. Are we going to make all our decisions via committee? Are we going to choose a leader? If we are going to choose a leader, how would we do that? Those, I think, are genuine political questions. But I think now they only really apply to that small scale. At the large scale, it doesn't exist. It's not politics anymore. It's just power. And some people have it. Most people don't. So, act accordingly.